It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible. And you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Both Zoroastrianism and Jewish mysticism heavily influence Gnosticism. Now, the Gnostic belief in a divine spark that is trapped in the material world, which is controlled by evil forces, comes directly from Zoroastrianism and Merkaba mysticism, which is known today as Kabbalah. Now, one of the most notable of these groups of Gnostics influenced by Zoroastrianism was the Manichaeans founded by the so-called prophet Mani in the 3rd century CE or AD. And it was Mani's teachings that combined elements of Christianity, Buddhism, and Zoroastrianism to create a complex com cosmology that emphasized the struggle between light and dark. Zoroastrianism also influenced the development of the modern form of New Age spirituality, particularly through the work of women like Helena Blavatsky and her Theosophical Society. Blavatsky's writings drew heavily on Eastern religions, including Zoroastrianism, to create a synchronistic spiritual system that emphasized on dualism. It literally used the dualism of Zoroastrianism to create the Luciferian religion that we see today that is used and followed and worshipped by so many of the elite of the leaders of the world. I wanted to focus on redemption through sin, a doctrine that is often attributed to a variation of Lurianic Kabbalah, made popular by Shabbatai Zevi, the false messiah, and Jacob Frank, his false resurrection. If you are new to this type of study, I recommend going back and watching the first video I did in this series on Freemasonry, which is really a primer and introduction into everything this series will be focusing on. With that being said, some of you might be familiar with the term Sabbatean Frankism. This type of mysticism, which is shared even today by various Gnostic and Satanic sects, really came into popularization by the Sabbateans of various Donmer Jewish groups situated around the Balkans. This is a story of mysticism, revolution, secrecy, and blood sacrifice, which would eventually spill over into something called the Armenian Genocide and the establishment of Israel. In order to make sense of this practice of redemption through sin, it's important to go to the beginning and what better place to start than the story of Shabbatai Zevi, the false messiah of 1666. Read in Barmida, Rabbah C21, and Jalkut 772 of the Babylonian Talmud, it claims, Every Jew who spills the blood of the godless is doing the same thing as making a sacrifice unto God. An Ashkenazi Jewish man named Sabbatai Zevi was born in 1626 in Smyrna, now a part of modern-day Turkey. Growing up in a traditional Jewish family, Sabbatai was made to attend a yeshiva under the rabbi of Smyrna, Joseph Eskapa, 
With a particular focus on the Talmud, Shabbatai found himself deeply interested in the Kabbalah from a very young age. The mystical and esoteric teachings of rabbinical Judaism and the occult became a pinnacle focus of his life, in particular the Zohar. By the age of 22, Shabbatai Zevi had developed narcissism and something of a god complex, likening himself to the Moshiach, which of course is the prophesied Jewish Messiah, who would restore Israel to its heavenly glory. In early 1666, the long-awaited Jewish Messiah was poised to overthrow the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, cross Sambachian River, and return astride a lion leading an army composed of the ten lost tribes of Israel. With his adept knowledge of Lorianic mysticism and the Zohar, he would attribute certain passages found in Kabbalistic texts to himself. For instance, his birthday was also Tisha B'Av, an important Jewish feast day holiday which observed the mourning and the destruction of the first Jewish temple and the second Jewish temple. In Hebrew, Shabbatai means Saturn, and in Jewish tradition, the reign of Sabbatai, the highest planet, was often likened to the advent of the Messiah. He would wed the daughter of Moses the prophet and gather the exiles. The nations of the world would bow before him and the third temple in Jerusalem would be built inaugurating the Messianic Age. Shabbatai Zevi amazed a small following of sycophants which devoted their time to the study of the Kabbalah and observation of the teachings of Shabbatai Zevi, which would later become known as Sabbateanism. They were mostly seen as a rebellious group which gave no heed to studies in Halakha, or Jewish law. Many academics and historians have noted that Shabbatai Zevi broke many Jewish laws and customs, putting himself above them. From eating forbidden foods, to working on the Sabbath, and making proclamations of himself, which offended many people. According to Dr. Henry Abramson, a Jewish historian, Shabbatai told his followers that he could fly, but he refused to demonstrate this publicly. Shabbatai often went out of his way to break Jewish customs and do things which were forbidden to the Jews, often engaging in acts that were considered profane, evil, and vile. While Shabbatai did gain more followers, his influence was not yet realized beyond the scope of cities local to him. There was a division among the Jews, and many started to grow very suspicious and angry about Shabbatai and his influence that he was getting. A group of Jews, led by Shabbatai's former teacher at the yeshiva, banished Shabbatai and his disciples from Smyrna in around 1651. Shabbatai and his followers were subject to an edict of harem, a type of excommunication in Judaism. However, this did not stop him. In fact, this is around the time Shabbatai's influence started to become widely recognized. Shabbatai Zevi would often shout the words of Isaiah 14.14, 14, attributing this verse to be about himself. Quote, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Unquote. Which is really interesting because if you read the chapter in context, these words are not spoken by the Messiah, but by Lucifer who was cast down below and cursed by God. In Christian theology, this figure is known as Satan and is the one who gives power onto the Antichrist, who will attempt to do the exact same thing, ascend to the heights of God, even declare himself to be either God himself or the Messiah. This is also marked by the building of the third temple, of which Shabbatai's birth date is built in memory of the first fallen two. Kabbalah that teaches salvation through sin that also influenced Calvinism because if nothing we do is going to affect our salvation because everything has already been predetermined, then you can sin as much as you want to. Because if God's already preordained you to be, you know, one of the elect or not, then nothing you're going to do is going to make a difference. Exactly. It ties in with the, 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 the old uh, false teaching of cheap grace. You know, um, okay, uh, you've been predestined. Okay, you can do what you want 
uh, as much as you want it, uh, you know, you're going to heaven. I mean, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Not at all. Not at all. And However, according to Adept Occultists, many believe Lucifer to be the messianic figure. By 1658, Shabbatai had surfaced in Constantinople. There he met a preacher, Abraham Yassini, a disciple of the Talmudic scholar Joseph Trani, who confirmed his messianic mission. Yassini is said to have forged a manuscript in archaic characters which bore testimony to Shabbatai's claim to being the Messiah. It was entitled The Great Wisdom of Solomon and began, quote, I, Abraham, was confined in a cave for 40 years, and I wondered greatly that the time of miracles did not arrive. Then was heard a voice proclaiming, A son will be born in Hebrew, year 5386, the year 1626, to Mordecai Zevi, and he will be called the Shabbatai. He will humble the great dragon. He, the true Messiah, will sit upon my throne. Unquote. Armed with this document in hand, he would travel to various cities which were important to the Jews at that time. There was a cycle of performing outrageous acts, defiling synagogues, breaking customs, and ultimately becoming banished again, often leaving with more followers. His exact route is contested historically, but from 1658, where he was banished from Constantinople, historians and Sabbatean literature has him appearing in Alexandria, Aleppo, and even back in Smyrna temporarily. However, Sabbatai and his followers would eventually end up in Cairo in about the year 1660. While he was there, he befriended Raphael Joseph Halabi of Aleppo, a wealthy and influential Jew who held the high position of mint master and tax farmer in Cairo under the Ottoman government. Raphael Joseph, also a proponent of the Kabbalah, would ultimately become one of Shabbatai's greatest supporters, heavily promoting Shabbatai's messianic claims and financing his movement for years to come. Many of these early documents were actually written to explain to the early adopters of the messianic faith, like you know, the wealthy Chalebi Raphael Joseph, who would actually bankroll the first years of the movement. You got to get that guy on board, the money guy. But just what did these people have their faith in exactly? What did it mean for Shabbatai Tzvi to be a messiah at all? In 1663, Shabbatai had moved to Jerusalem with his followers. Gradually, he gathered a larger circle of adherents, where they would feast together, sing songs, and preach about a practice which would become known as redemption through sin. During these years, Shabbatai met a teenage Polish orphan woman named Sarah, who reportedly, up until this time, lived a life of prostitution and desperation. Despite this, Sarah claimed that she was destined to be married to the Messiah. Shabbatai claimed that such a consort had been promised to him in a dream, because he, as the Messiah, was bound to fall in love with an unclean and unchaste woman. In 1665, in an attempt to prove himself as the Messiah, he broke into the Izmir synagogue, kicked down the doors, and loudly started proclaiming the Tetragrammaton, an act that is sharply forbidden in Judaism. His deeds were considered to be gravely heretical, as this act was only permitted to be done by the high priest of Israel in the Temple of Jerusalem on Yom Kippur. By doing this, he was asserting himself above the authority of all rabbis and declaring himself to be the Messiah. This gained a lot of attention from the Jews in Jerusalem, again causing a lot of division. However, Shabbatai would use his friendship with Raphael Joseph of Aleppo, the banker, in getting the funds needed to pay off the Turks, who at the time were heavily taxing Jews in Jerusalem under the Ottoman leadership. This gained him much prestige and favour among the Jews. One Jew in particular who noticed was a man named Nathan Benjamin Levy, known since as Nathan of Gaza, who became very active in Shabbatai's messianic career, serving as his right-hand man, and declaring himself to be the risen Elijah, who would proclaim the arrival of the Messiah. Many historians likened him to the John the Apostle of Jesus of Nazareth. In 1665, Nathan announced that the Messianic Age would begin in 1666 with the conquest of the world without bloodshed. The Messiah would lead the Ten Lost Tribes back to the Holy Land, riding on a lion with a seven-headed dragon in its jaws. 
Nathan of Gaza would be the leading influencer in spreading the Sabbatean movement, with much of today's literature on Sabbateanism being based on his writings. It would also be up to his prophet, Nathan of Gaza, to actually build out a fully developed Kabbalistic theory to justify not just Shabbatite Tzvi's messianic claims, but also his aberrant behavior, his apparent apostasy, and, well, his death. Nathan of Gaza, according to his own writings, seemed to truly believe that Shabbatai Zevi was the proclaimed Messiah, after having a revelation of Shabbatai sitting on a throne of glory in heaven. Nathan of Gaza would very actively write about this in letters he addressed to various synagogues all over the world, and because of this, Shabbatai's fame began to extend internationally. Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands were already centers of his messianic movement. Shabbatai's followers soon included many prominent rabbis, many of which would later write texts declaring Shabbatai Zevi to be the promised Messiah and the year of salvation to be 1666. When faced with criticisms about Shabbatai's erratic behavior and violation of Jewish law, Nathan would find a way to put a positive spin on it. According to Nathan of Gaza, in a book titled The Seventeen Prophets, Book One by Matt Goldish, quote, they were necessary mystical exercises by which the Messiah would redeem the world. Unquote. Redemption through sin. Now again in Smyrna, Shabbatai, at the beginning of 1666, left for Constantinople, supposedly with the ambitions of overthrowing the Sultan. Since Nathan of Gaza prophesied that, once in Constantinople, Shabbatai would place the Sultan's crown on his own head. The Grand Vizier, Fazil Ahmed Pasha ordered his immediate arrest and had him imprisoned, perhaps to avoid any doubts as to the power still wielded by the Turkish Sultanate. However, his imprisonment discouraged neither Shabbatai nor his followers. In fact, he was treated very well in prison, perhaps because of bribes which seemed to have strengthened his followers' belief in him. Meanwhile, Nathan of Gaza, Abraham Yassini, and others circulated fabulous reports about the miraculous deeds the Messiah was supposedly performing in the Turkish capital, and the messianic expectations in the Jewish diasporas continued to rise. It is said by many Jewish scholars at the time, about half of the world of international Jewry had become believers in Shabbatai's messiahship. It was a sentiment shared very liberally by many Jewish historians. The Sabbatean movement boasted a following of about one million Jews at this time. Shabbatai Zevi's face even appeared in prayer books next to King David. Jews began to unroof their houses and prepare for a new exodus. In almost every synagogue, Shabbatai's initials were posted and prayers of him were inserted in the following form. Quote, Bless our Lord and King the holy and righteous Shabbatai Zevi, the Messiah of the God of Jacob, unquote. Jewish excitement, coupled with Shabbatai's constant ambitions to overthrow the Sultan, became very widespread, to the point where Sultan Mehmed V, the leader of the Ottoman Empire, was forced to make an example out of Shabbatai. Shabbatai was removed from Abiados and taken to Andrianople, where the vizier gave him a choice, death or conversion. According to Robert Zephyr in his book, 1666, Redemption Through Sin, quote, The most commonly accepted version of this story is the Sultan offered Shabbatai Zevi the choice of either publicly converting to Islam or being beheaded. As the Sultan so delicately put it, your head or the turban. The turban was, of course, a symbol of converting to Islam, unquote. On the following day, September 16th, 1666, Shevi appeared before the Sultan, cast off his Jewish garb, and put on a Turkish turban on his head, thereby accomplishing his conversion to Islam. The Sultan rewarded Shabbatai by conferring on him the title Mahmed Effendi, and appointed him the generous title of Keeper of the Gate. You know, like a gatekeeper. Now, the Kabbalists, they see the tarot as keys to the Tree of Life, and the 22 cards, including... The 21 trumps plus the fool or zero card and often called major arcana or great mysteries are seen as 
correspondence to the 22 Hebrew letters and the 22 paths of the tree. And the 10 in each suit correspond to the Sephirot and the four Kabbalistic worlds and the 16 court cards relate to the classical elements in the four worlds, while the Sephirot describe the nature of divinity. The paths between them descend ways of knowing the divine. Synchronicity of Kabbalah, alchemy, astrology, and other esoteric hermetic disciplines. Orders of angels, according to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn's interpretation of the Kabbalah, there are, according to them, ten archangels, each commanding one of the choirs of angels and corresponding to one of the Sephirot is based on, guess what? What is it based on? The Jewish Kabbalah. So they can call it Hermetic Kabbalah. They can call it Christian Kabbalah. It doesn't really matter. Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. With Kabbalah, Metatron has absolutely nothing to do with the Father or Jesus Christ, his son. Metatron is a fallen watcher from a very, compared to first Enoch, A very new, newly written text of 2nd and 3rd Enoch, where the patriarch Enoch actually turns into an angel. And this angel's name is Metatron. And, of course, Metatron becomes the Messiah. Well, Metatron is not Jesus Christ, and more than that, Metatron is not even Enoch, unless he is Enoch the evil from the line of Cain, but that's not even possible, and I'll tell you why. Because the setting in 2nd and 3rd Enoch is in heaven, and Metatron is not in heaven. Metatron is another name for Allah. Metatron is another name for Mazda the one of the deities from Zoroastrianism. Metatron is a, another name for Hillel or Enlil. Metatron is another name, in my opinion, for Azazel. Metatron is another name for Samael. Metatron is a, another name for Baal, Baalzebub. Metatron is Satan is what? I am trying to get across to you guys. Stay away from Metatron. Stay away from 2nd and 3rd Enoch. 2nd Enoch is a Gnostic book. 3rd Enoch is a Kabbalistic book. Now, the Roman quote-unquote god Mercury and the chemical element Mercury is who the 8th emanation is supposed to be. The, The ninth. The general principle involved is that the the Kabbalist will meditate on these attributions and by this means to acquire an understanding of the character of the Sephirah, including its correspondences, tarot, and the tree of life. Hermetic Kabbalists see, they see the caretaker of the tarot as keys to the truth. In speaking of Messianic DMT, that if I would achieve Adam consciousness through DMT, that I would be a Christ. I would be a part of Messiah. And collectively, when enough people can go back to the Adam consciousness through the DMT experience, Messiah comes. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. The forced conversion was likened to the birth pains of the Messiah. In March 1668, Shabbatai announced that he had been filled with the Holy Spirit at Passover and had received a revelation. Either Shabbatai or one of his followers published a mystical work claiming that he was the true Messiah in spite of his conversion and that his goal was to bring thousands of Muslims to Judaism. Many of his followers, the Donmei Jews, maintained an outward appearance of Islamic while secretly practiced the Kabbalah and observed Talmudic texts. 
According to Rabbi Yaakov Lieb, the current director of Don Mayer West, a California neo sabbatean organization founded in 1972, quote, It is commonly held conjecture that Sabbatai Zevi's conversion to Islam was an act of cowardice that betrayed the Jewish people. However, this conversion was not an act of cowardice, but in fact, one of the mystical Masa'im Zarim, strange actions, that he and Nathan of Gaza believed the Messiah was destined to perform, based on their reading of the Kabbalah, unquote. The Turkish Ottoman started to become sick of Shabbatai's antics by 1673, ending his gatekeeper's salary, and had him and many of his followers exiled to a small town near Thessalonica. Shabbatai wrote to the Jewish community in Berat, Albania, requesting religious books. Shortly afterwards, he died in isolation. His biographer, Gershem Sholem, mentions that his tomb was visited by Don May pilgrims from Salonika until the early 20th century. Quote, by 1680, the Don May had congregated in Salonika, the cosmopolitan and majority Jewish city in Ottoman Greece. For the next 250 years, they would lead an independent communal life, intermarrying, doing business together, maintaining their own shrines, and handing down their secret traditions. Unquote. The foundation of the Sabbatean movement had Kabbalah as its basis. It was the central theme which underpinned the entire messianic movement of Shabbatai Zevi, but it also popularized an element of the Kabbalah and messianism which is still alive and present in various Gnostic and occult practices today, the idea of redemption through sin. In order to understand this a little more deeply, one must familiarize themselves with the work of 16th century Jewish Kabbalist Isaac Luria, who was a key figure in marrying mysticism with messianism together. He helped form an era which brought these schools of thought into the mainstream Jewish world. Shabbatai biographer Gershom Shalem argued that the Lorianic Kabbalah became the dominant theology across the Jewish world at the time of Shabbatai Zevi. The Lorianic idea, which was adopted by Shabbatai Zevi, Nathan of Gaza, and other Shabbatean philosophers, was that humanity, or perhaps more likely the Jewish people, you know, the chosen ones, in general played a crucial role in the restoration of a pristine world. This concept is called Tikkun Olam, a concept of healing the world, which is coupled with a justification of Zionism. Dr. Andrew M. Henry, a scholar of religious studies, gives us a simplified breakdown explaining this in some more detail. At the beginning of the universe, there were divine sparks called Nitzotzot that were contained in cosmic vessels. But these vessels cracked, sending the sparks down into the world of chaos. Various schools of Kabbalah differ slightly in what caused this shattering, but generally it has something to do with the original sin of Adam and Eve. In order to bring about the utopian messianic future, all the sparks must be gathered up and raised back to the higher world from where they came. And the Messiah played a large role in that process. This was the theological rationale offered by some Sabbateans to explain Shabtai Zvi's conversion to Islam, that some of the divine sparks that needed to be recovered to achieve the Messianic age were stuck outside the confines of Judaism. The verse from Isaiah 53, but he was wounded because of our transgressions, came to be reinterpreted to mean the Messiah must be made profane, unholy, non-Jewish, in order to complete his mission. Alice Bailey, I, I did a lot of research on her and Helena Blavatsky in the beginning years of my research, but Alice Bailey shockingly said that the most basic initiations would be taking place in the evangelical churches. Not very long from when she wrote her book her many books. She wrote about 30 books back in around the 1930s to the 50s. And here we are today. We have the basic initiations of Kabbalah taking place in our churches. Uh, one of those, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, he listed, I think it was 13 mystics 
New Agers and spiritualists of all kinds in that book. And that's why I put the Kabbalistic tree on the front cover. That's one reason, because I want people to know the purpose-driven life, the, the Kabbalah tree is on the front of the original publication of that book. It's the, the tree with the roots penetrating down into the ground. And that represents as above, so below. We've, they've been putting their mark, their symbolism, their doctrines, their teachings right in front of us for years, and we've not seen it. We just, we've been hoodwinked. <laughs> the church yes. has been duped. Yes. And we need to get, we need to get up to speed and see what's going on and stand, stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ and not another Christ. This is, Amen. this is all about another Yeshua, another Jesus. And that's why I wrote the book, just so people could get familiar with basics. This, this book just gives you kind of the basics, but when you, if you read it and then you hear it and then you see it, you're going to recognize it. Quote, Thus, sin became a religious holy rite, an appeal to the carnal mind of men, for it offered them the freedom to carry out the basest urges of all fallen men. It thus became indistinguishable from Satanism. Its primary means of evangelism was to infiltrate and corrupt other religions in order to redeem the lights trapped in darkness of those other religions." Unquote. Nathan of Gaza, who was well adept into Lorianic mysticism, declared Sevi to be the incarnation of the six Sephira, the redemptive Tephira, the Sephira that harmonizes Gevura and Chesed. In other words, it was declared that Sevi, the Messiah, was tasked with descending into the realms of evil to single-handedly free the captive sparks to complete the work of redemption. These evil realms, known as the Klipot, were so well fortified that the Jews were not able to reclaim these divine sparks that revealed the Iron Soph through their good works. It could only be done by taking that which is divine and descending it into the lowest parts of darkness, profanity and evil. By descending into chaos and corruption, reclaiming these sparks, one could rise from the ashes like the phoenix. As I am much more familiar with Jewish mysticism and Jewish Kabbalah than I am with Hermetic Kabbalah, which stems from Neoplatonism and Crowleyan Satanism, otherwise known as Black Magic. Now, don't mistake me. There is absolutely nothing worse about Crowley Satanism and black magic, the left-hand path. There is nothing more evil about this form of witchcraft and sorcery than there is the Jewish Kabbalah. Jewish mysticism is 100% witchcraft. It is 100% sorcery. And more than anything else, it is 100% perversion of the worship of the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is these mystics from the, believe it or not, southern nation of Judah where our Lord was born out of that rejected and crucified him. Now, I am not in any way, shape, form or fashion judging or calling them more wicked than any of the rest of us because they rejected our Lord and crucified him because the truth of the matter is at one point in time in each and every one of our lives we have also rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and put him to an open chain crucifying him all over again and if you do not believe me i suggest you go read hebrews chapter 10 i would suggest reading the entire book of hebrews that being said back to hermetic kabbalah and alistair crowley doth is not assigned a number as it is considered a part of bina or bana or a hidden sephira and each sephira is considered to be an emanation of the divine energy often described as the divine light 
whichever flows from the unmanifest through Keter into manifestation. This flow of light is indicated by the lightning flash shown on the diagrams of the Sephirot tree, which passes through each Sephirot in turn according to their enumerations. I would just like to stop for a second and quote my Lord and Savior. Jesus said, Behold, I saw Satan fall like light, fall from heaven like lightning. So, when you see Ein Sof, which starts at the top of the Sephirot tree, whether it is Hermetic Kabbalah, which is Crowley Satanism, that he literally stole from other more learned and, frankly, more talented magicians, if one can be called such a thing, how can you be talented at damning yourself and others? But regardless, he simply plagiarized the work of more learned men like John D. Like a woman, for crying out loud. Now, I know that you feminists out there will get very angry at me, but we are talking about the 1800s. In the 1800s, feminism had not even begun. It, it, it wasn't even heard of. So for Crowley to take someone's work like Helen of Lovatsky's and not only idolize it, but call it his own and make it his own was showing just how untalented the wickedest man in the world truly was. Now here we are in the year 2024 and Aleister Crowley, a heroin addict who died broke, alone, and addicted to a drug that almost killed me and quite frankly could have been the end of me. I cannot tell you how many times the enemy tried to take my life using a needle that I chose to stick in my own body. I have passed out, shot up, and gotten high in places that would make Mr. Crowley cringe, I guarantee you. Now, that being said, we're just talking about addiction. I honestly was never involved in Satanism, and as wicked of a man as I was, and as hateful, cruel, and quite frankly, bloodthirsty as I was, I wasn't a Satanist. I knew better than to play around with black magic. I knew better to play around with white magic. I did not mess with Ouija boards. I did not play with seances. Heck, I would not, as big of a drug addict as I was, and as big of a drug dealer as I was, I would not touch drugs like LSD or mushrooms or ayahuasca, or any hallucinogens, simply because even though I was not a follower of Christ, I was very far from the straight and narrow, and I was on my way to hell with gasoline drawers. I still did not mess around with the occult. If you want to know why the Remnant Warrior never messed around with the occult, all you have to do is go to the Kingdom Productions and Publishing Facebook page. And I think it's 2019's a Halloween episode. And you'll find out just how young I was the first time I had an experience with true evil. It's back to Crowley. The flash shown on the diagrams of the Sephirot tree that pass through each Sephirah in turn according to their enumerations. Each Sephirah is a nexus of so-called divine energy, and each has a number of attributions. These attributions enable the Kabbalists to form a 
comprehension of each particular Sephiroth's characteristics. The manner of applying many attributions to each Sephiroth is an exemplar of the diverse nature of Hermetic Kabbalah. For example, the Sephiroth Hode has the attributions of glory, perfect intelligence, the eight of the tarot deck, the planet Mercury. First of all, Mercury is not a planet. There is no such thing as planets, but we're not going to go there. They're wandering stars. That's all I'm going to say about it. In any case, the Egyptian god Thoth, the Archangel Michael. Yeah, right. The Archangel, let me tell you something, friends. The Archangel Michael has absolutely nothing. And I'm sorry, Jay Woodward. I like your videos. Every once in a while, I watch Woodward TV. But the Archangel Michael is not Jesus Christ. And he has absolutely nothing to do with the Kabbalah. Um, I just want to say that both Zoroaster himself and Zoroastrianism played a significant role in shaping both ancient Gnosticism and modern New Age spirituality. Its dualistic worldview and emphasis on spiritual evolution continue to influence misguided spiritual seekers who choose to reject the only source of truth that is found in Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Now, brothers and sisters, I truly hope you've enjoyed this brief video. And Hello, brothers and sisters. This is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace.